this video, we're going to be looking at how can we apply the particle in a box model that we have studied to some examples in organic chemistry. In this particular case, conjugation that you have in molecules, polyenes, pi systems. Now, remember that for those pi systems, you have in principle conjugated double bonds that are forming are formed because you have hybridization sp2 in your carbons. The idea with that hybridization is that there is one p orbital for each one of those carbons participating in these double bonds, and then you can have um, in, in principle, you can have the delocalization of those pi electrons over the entire system. Thinking about in that way, you can then say, well, one of those pi electrons that are delocalized all around my molecule can be modeled as a electron that is confined in a box whose dimensions is the size of the molecule. The electron cannot move further down the extension or the extent of the molecule. And also, we can think about the energy levels represented for those energy levels in a particle in a box as uh, correlated with the pi orbitals that are formed in your system. Remember that you're going to have bonding and anti-bonding, and also the highest occupied molecular orbital, I'm going to be referring to that as HOMO, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, referred here as LUMO, is the difference between those two levels. That's the energy that is going to be involved in those uh, transitions. So, for example, in the case where you have one double bond, you have uh, two, um, you have uh, one pi orbital that is bonding, one pi orbital that is anti-bonding, you have two pi electrons, so they're filling up uh, the ground state and one an energy level in your particle in a box. If there's some excitation with the proper amount of energy, there's going to be a transition between n equals 1 to n equals 2, and that energy, difference in energy, is the one that is being analyzed in your UV spectroscopy, for example. Well, similarly, if you have for a molecule that contains now two double bonds, uh, you're going to have two pi orbitals that are bonding, two pi orbitals that are anti-bonding. Uh, excitation with the proper amount of light is going to give you a uh, electron transition from HOMO to LUMO, and in this case, um, again, thinking in the, in the language of particle in a box, the HOMO will correspond to the energy level n equals 2, and the transition where the electron lands, finally, it's going to be n equals 3. So if you keep doing this analysis for molecules that contains three double bonds, four double bonds, and more, uh, what you will find is that the number of double bonds will correspond to the, um, the energy level in your particle in a box where the transition originates. Again, for one double bond, n equals is going to be 1. For two double bonds, n is going to be equal to 2. And then the transition where it goes, it's going to be n plus 1, so it'll be d plus 1. Another thing that we have to take into consideration is the length of the box. For this, we're going to do this simplification. Of course, double bonds and single bonds are uh, different in length, but we're going to just take sort of like the average between the two of them. So we're going to count that the um, the length of the chain, which is going to be equal to the length of, of the box in the particle in a box model, um, is going to be equal to 2 times the number of double bonds minus 1 multiplied by the length of each carbon-carbon um, bonds. And again, this carbon-carbon bond is just the average between double bond and single bond length. So uh, let's test this formula for the case where we have three double bonds. We have one, two, three, four, five carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, let's look at this. It's two times three double bonds. That's six minus one is five. And yeah, that's the number of bonds that we counted um, in the number of carbon-carbon bonds that we counted as being um, the extent of my box. So something to have in mind because we're going to use that to make simplifications. Now we're going to be using the equation for the energy that corresponds to the particle in a box. Now remember that this one goes as n squared, where n is the energy level, and we have a bunch of constants. In the case of the length of the box, it's, it's going to be also a variable because we want to analyze how that box changes or how the energy changes also with the length of the box for each one of those uh, different compounds. But the transition, the change in the energy, then is going to correspond to the energy level n plus 1 squared minus n squared divided by the square of the box length and multiplied by this bunch of constants. So if we relate now the number or the energy level between the for the transitions with the number of bonds as we saw before, and we have this formulation right here. So the, the first one on the top corresponds to uh, the difference in energy between n plus 1 and n minus 1, each of those is squared, and the one in the bottom corresponds to the length of my box related to the number of double bonds. And here I'm already taking into account the fact that I have to multiply by the average carbon-carbon uh, bond distance. So these, as you can see, is a bunch of constants that I can just calculate one time, and then I can just work out with uh, relatively simple numbers. Now, this is the result I'm already taking into account and making the proper conversions from nanometers to meters. I'm taking the square and everything, the uh, particular values that I have for, for all those constants, and um, at the end, I have this value. Now, pay attention to these uh, unit analysis. Make sure, convince yourself that the units that I have written here are actually corresponding to joules, which is expected because these numbers are unitless, and then the change in energy should be in units of energy. In this case, the units will be joules. So this 
whole bunch of constants will have to come up with units. In that case, those units will be joules. So again, convince yourself that that is the case. Now let's do the first example. Whenever we have um, only one double bond, the change in energy for this transition between N1 and N2 is going to be equal to, um, the double bond is only one, so it's two times one plus one. On the bottom, the length is going to be uh, the length is going to be scaled by two plus one minus one. So what I have on the top, uh, remember this is just a constant, so I don't need to calculate it every time. It's just that constant. On top, I'm going to get a three, and in the bottom, I'm going to go one square, which is one. So is this constant times three, and I end up having this much energy. We can do the same calculation for whenever we have two double bonds, and then I'm not going to repeat all those calculations since I already know that this is a constant. Now I have two double bonds, it's 2 times 2 plus 1, that's 5, and the bottom is going to be 2 times 2 minus 1, so that's going to be 4 minus 1, 3, and that's a square. So when I take this value times this value, I end up getting about 1.7, 10 to the minus 18 joules. So now you can see what happens with the energy as the number of double bonds increase. Three double bonds, same substitutions, I end up with this value. Now, again, look at the trend in the energy. It's decreasing from a single from one double bond, two double bonds, three double bonds, and so on. Let's do the calculations for any, uh, for four double bonds. Again, lower energy than before. When we have five double bonds, and I end up with even uh, lower energy. So you can see immediately what the trend is. Now, if you were to think about in terms of the wavelength of absorption for those, what you're going to find is that uh, for the double bond equals one, the wavelength that corresponds to that absorption will be about 21 nanometers. And experimentally, that is 170 nanometers. As you go for uh, other energy levels, of course, the discrepancy is still there. For example, when you have two double bonds, 116 versus 217, three double bonds, the idea here is that it's not that it gives you exactly the same results as you will be expecting experimentally, since obviously this is a very crude model plus all the simplifications, but it gives you an idea of the ballpark where these absorptions in terms of the energy and the wavelengths are going to be located. So that's great.